want to scoot over a little bit more towards me so you like, yeah, I feel like you're in your timeout chair. Like, let's, right? here, like I'm gonna, here, I'm gonna scoot over. And then that's, yes. Is that better? Yes. yes. Together. I hope you all yes. enjoyed your delicious lunch. My name is Christina Langdon, and I have been on the board of the Connie Dwyer Breast Cancer Foundation for 10 years. It's been my pleasure. And I'm so excited to bring two brands, the foundation and her MD here today. I couldn't be more thrilled to connect two missions that are in pursuit of changing women's health care. I'm excited that it's about healthy aging, something that we all need to learn more about. I'm excited that it's about menopause. <laughs> I, who's having a hot flash right now? I had one before I came up, right? And survivorship. Uh, in 2019, I was diagnosed with AML leukemia, and I went through a year of very, very difficult treatment with Becky Moreno at my side, sorry. And they don't tell you, like when you are you know, trying to survive and get through cancer treatments, they don't really tell you what it's like to come out of it. It wreaks havoc on your mental health and on your physical health. And it put me deep into menopause. And so I went to my OBGYN and with my full list of symptoms, and I said, here's what I'm experiencing. And it was really vulnerable. I'd just come out of treatment, and I was having all of these pretty big issues. And she looked at me, my OBGYN, who delivered my babies, and she told me I would have to grin and bear it. I mean, she, she looked at me in the visit that I'm paying for, and she said that I would have to grin and bear it. And I was just so taken aback by it. Three years ago, I met Dr. Somi Javed, and I shared my experience with her, and she said, that is not accurate. Every woman who's experiencing your symptoms has options, they have treatment, they have proven protocols for women to feel better and to live the life that they want to live. I've had the pleasure of getting to know her over the three years, and she is simply changing women's health care. She has a special magic about her, and it's not only she's got centers now across the country. She's coming here. We're so lucky uh, in June, and uh, she is changing not only how they are treating patients, but also changing. She's on the board of the FDA. She works with them. She has I a consult when they need help. Them. Yeah. <laughs> She's raising a voice, and I just I want to read this one statement because I want to make sure I'm giving her the credit that is due. She is a leading women's se sexual health thought leader and menopause advocate. Her, work, her work's mission is to make women's health care exceptional by educating, advocating for, and empowering patients to take control of their health concerns. She is an inspiration, and we're so lucky <laughs> because she's helping each, every one of us in this room with the work that she's doing. And she's doing it with her sister, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure I give Somi her proper title. So Somi, Dr. Somi Javed is the chief medical officer and founder of HerMD. Her sister is the chief growth officer of HerMD. And I've, I think I've known probably Kamal for about 10 years, mm -hmm. and she is uh, one of the most strategic marketers that I've ever worked with in my 30 years in business. She has a unique ability where she can understand the customer very, very deeply, understand the patient's needs, and she has the ability to translate that, not just in marketing and branding, but also in education. She's changing the narrative around women's health care, and she's doing it not just for her MD, which is raising its reputation and its value, but also changing the customer narrative for all of women's health care around these issues. So I have the pleasure of uh, calling her my friend. <laughs> and then we have Susan Langdon, who I, when I first met, I called her very sad. <laughs> <laughs> menopause, menopause. <laughs> it's menopause. It's menopause. <laughs> All right, I want to make sure. Uh, 
Uh, she's best known um, as the co-host of the iconic TLC show, What Not to Wear. How many of you? I mean, oh. I think I've watched it on repeat like oh, five God. times. I, I told I her. Was, I was literally like, she has I'm been a regular correspondent on the Today Show, The Oprah Show, Access Hollywood, and Rachel Ray. She co-founded State of Menopause and has since sunsetted it to focus on education and healthcare advocacy for those in midlife and menopause. Her next project mm -hmm. uh, is a media platform dedicated to these same issues and it's going to debut in 2024. So before I hand it over to our esteemed panelists, I want to remind everybody that the silent auction is open until three o'clock and I think there's a QR code on the tables so you can easily bid from there. So without further ado, Um, but when she introduced me to the Connie Dwyer Foundi Breast Cancer Foundation, um, as I said earlier, I knew we had to be involved. Um, it aligns so well with, with our mission. And this focus on access and education and empowerment is so key. And so education um, is really near and dear to us because as we go around the country, and as I've been, I'm in New Jersey, I'm local, I have so many friends here. Um, they're, yes, they're all like, no one tells us about menopause, no one talks to us about sex, sexual health, um, even basic gynecologic issues. They're kind of dismissed and you know run through their 10 to 15 minute appointment. And so what I'm proud to say is that um, we're gonna change that narrative. Um, and I'm honored to have my sister here with me, um, my founder, Somi Javade, and Stacy London, who I now also call a friend as well as a colleague. And we brought you the best of the best to amazing women who are brave, honest, um, trailblazers in this space. They're gonna get real honest and really real today. So we're gonna have a really fun um, talk um, and Q&A afterwards. So we're just gonna get right to the good stuff, I think. Um, so Stacy, you've been vocal about your experience with menopause and it kind of hitting you like a freight train I Mack think? truck. A Mack truck is yes, the I metaphor know. that I love yes. to use. So tell us about that Mack truck that kind of hits you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we were just talking about this at our table. Um, hello, I want to say thank you for having me. Thank you to her MD and the foundation. It's so nice to be here with all of you. And you all look really good, so that's a relief. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to get that off my chest. <laughs> but uh, menopause really hit me by surprise. And when I mean surprise, I actually didn't know what was happening to me. When perimenopause started, I had just had uh, spine surgery. I got my period twice in January of 2017. Never saw that bitch again. Never <laughs> saw her again. And what was so interesting about it was that I blamed everything that I was experiencing, anxiety, depression, like mood dysregulation, night sweats, insomnia, on the surgery, because it had been such an extensive spine surgery that my surgeon said, your body doesn't know that you weren't in an accident, right? So you may be experiencing feelings that are, are you know, almost like you died. And so I, I believed that, right? I didn't know what else it could be. And I spent 18 months doing stringent physical rehab. Um, that's why I don't wear heels as much as I used to. Uh, only to get better and find that my dad was very sick. And he had a heart disease. And I started to notice that I was so worried about him all the time that I started to get heart palpitations. And he would not all of a sudden not be able to eat or keep food down. And I had food allergies. And he had muscle pain and I had joint pain. And he would get a rash and then all of a sudden I would have a rash and I thought, oh my God, is this the physical manifestation of grief? And is it fear that I'm gonna lose my dad? And then of course, when he passed away, all of these symptoms hit me all at once. Brain fog, insomnia, the hot flashes, the joint pain, the food allergies, you name a perimenopausal symptom, at least the top 34 <laughs> common ones, and I had it. But nobody told me. My doctor poo-pooed it and said, yeah, it might be menopause, you'll deal, right? My gynecologist said to me, use it or lose it. And I had 
no idea what she was talking about. I was like, use what and lose what. <laughs> so I was approached by a brand that, um, a company that owned the brand, State of Menopause, uh, that said to me, we'd love for you to be a beta tester. And I was a very vocal beta mm -hmm. tester. I had a lot to say about everything that they were making. And when they decided that they did not want to do product, I stepped in and acquired the company because I did not want to let go of this conversation. That was without understanding anything about menopause other than that I was furious that nobody told me. And I ran that company for three years, and you know we'll get into this conversation, but one of the things that I felt so strongly about learning about menopause in this three years, it is not enough to say, here's a body moisturizer that's gonna make your dry skin better, because you know, ladies, we know everything gets dry. <laughs> and if you don't know, you'll know someday. <laughs> and the one thing about that, right, is that I felt that while the original company had the goal of being first to market with some kind of menopause product, I really looked around at product market fit. Mm -hmm. And I did not feel comfortable, even with a first line of defense kind of products that really weren't addressing mm -hmm. the holistic needs of menopause. And it's one of the reasons that I'm so supportive of Somi and her MD, because I truly believe you. this is an issue where you need a really experienced health care practitioner to help you navigate this. And the more you know before you get there, the better off your experience is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you broke down a lot, or you talked a lot about the symptoms that I you're know, Thank you for doing my and job. I, yeah, yeah, sorry. I appreciate thank it. You. There you go. Those and are the uh, symptoms. I'm, I'm fortunate and grateful, and I, I've told Somi this time and again, that had I not worked for her MD, and learned about all of this, I would not know. And now I know so much, I'm self-diagnosing myself. I'm like, <laughs> I'm perimenopausal. I know I'm perimenopausal. I'm hot. I'm cold. I'm dry. Dry a lot of places, right, that we talk about. But so many. Very right? true. Right? Yeah, like, it's just, it's like a, a, a new evil you won't chapter be if you or come something. To her I don't MD. know. But you won't yes. be if you come to her MD. <laughs> it's like this, like, bad chapter or something, but I know that there's, you know, there's so many treatment options, but so many, talk a little bit about perimenopause and menopause, because you talked about, I started perimenopause, and like, how long does that last, and some of the classic symptoms that we should be looking out for. Yeah, so yeah. the average age of menopause is 51 um, in the United States, and so menopause can be defined a few different ways, 12 consecutive months with absolutely no bleeding, or a doctor can do a blood test checking the FSH, which is the menopause hormone. And if it's elevated, um, because it starts to go up, trying to wake up the ovaries going, where is the estrogen? Um, and so there's another way, because there's women who've had a partial hysterectomy or an ablation. Um, so there's blood testing that you can do as well. But perimenopause can have all the same symptoms from head to toe. So I tell women it's way more than a hot flash. I mean, even Oprah thought she had cardiovascular disease, but it was palpitations mm -hmm. from perimenopause. And so you can have cognitive decline, um, like when you put your uh, phone in the refrigerator or where you forget where your keys are and it's much more common, word finding, calling your children by the wrong names. I mean, really it affects us from head to toe. Weight gain, being dry everywhere. And that can, aside from vaginal dryness, sexual pain, it can also mm -hmm. be joint pain weight gain and where does it get you it gets you in your middle and so my patients now call it their menopot they're like dr javade what can you do about this menopot i didn't mind when i gained it in my breasts and my hips but this stings and so there was actually a study where um they looked and i'm not calling you mice ladies okay <laughs> but they took mice and they gave half fsh so made them menopausal and the other half um they didn't they all exercised the same and ate the same every single fsh or menopausal mouse became obese and so it changes the way we deposit fat in our body, and it also changes our metabolic rate. So, so many women come in with self-loathing and hate and going, oh my God, I just need to exercise more, I need to eat less. And it's like, no, your body is programming you know, these changes, it's not your fault. So that's the first thing we have to remove. Um, sexual dysfunction, and so what do I mean by that? No libido, problems with orgasm. Um, problems with arousal. So libido or desire is the intent. Like, ooh, I want to have sex or I want to be intimate. Arousal is your body's physical response. So not being dry, your heart rate going up, 
getting into it. Some women will say, oh, I want to, but even when I'm with my partner, I feel dead. I feel nothing. Or they'll describe themselves as, it used to be rainbows and now I feel beige. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I remember all the stories, you know, yeah. um, sexual pain. And when something hurts, guess what happens to your desire? Who wants to go do something that hurts? We eat ice cream, we eat sugar, because it gives us this euphoria in our brain. Nobody wants to have sex if it hurts. And so those are just some mm -hmm. of the symptoms. Anxiety, depression, insomnia. Rage. Rage. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about that earlier, weren't we? <laughs> and then, yeah. yes, and uh, flying off the handle. Yeah. You know, people are like, oh my god, I, I yell at people and I don't want to anymore. Yeah. Or I don't mind it so much. I know, right? Like, I want to, no. <laughs> going to sleep and waking up in the middle of the night and then not being able to go back to sleep. I mean, yeah. there's many, many gifts. But yeah. when I get really, really angry is when people offer alcohol as a treatment option. So you guys have all gotten uh, menopause treatment today if you drank because apparently that's the latest, <laughs> greatest technology. Or they're told to grin and bear it. Or they're told that there's nothing they can do and there's no option. That's when I literally want to pull out my hair and look like the Mr. Clean Man because... Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was going to say yeah. that the fact that this is your take on it is what's so revolutionary to me. It is not a surprise, really, that this is happening right now. I think our generation is really going to change the entire conversation about menopause. And it is happening, you know, in some ways, I think, because Gen X will not take no for an answer. No and way. we're in the middle of it, yeah. and we're like, wait, there's no info? So, you know, Dr. Javed is really giving us the lowdown. And the mm -hmm. fact is, it is absolutely mm -hmm. unacceptable for your doctor to dismiss any symptom. And that just the one thing I wanted to say, just in, in support of you, mm -hmm. is that you, everyone out here, you really need to be your own health advocate. Mm -hmm. And vote with your feet, as my friend Omi would say. That means walk if you do not get the standard of care that you deserve and that you feel. And we've been taught as women to feel unsafe in our bodies and not trust ourselves. Mm -hmm. Start listening to your own instincts and do not take no for an answer when it comes to your doctor. Don't stop until you find a Dr. Somi who can truly help you and hear you and become your co-conspirator in your own health. And you're yeah. absolutely right. And I, you know, sometimes, Stacey, it's like so hard to be a doctor on the panel because everyone's so mad at the doctors and there's all that menopausal rage and it's directed at you. Not at you. Not at me. <laughs> um, but less than 20% of OBGYNs are currently trained in this country. So I don't think most doctors are purposely withholding care. Mm -hmm. They're trying to see you in 15 minutes or they just don't know. And that's mm -hmm. what they should say. I don't know. I'm not a menopause specialist, but I can get you into the hands of one. Um, because currently in this country, about 73% of women who are struggling with menopausal symptoms are not offered treatment. Think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. um, it's crazy. And so at HerMD, we've developed something called HerMD University. We're changing the educational paradigm. Mm -hmm. We're training our providers so that when you come in, 100% of providers are trained in not only menopause, but also sexual health care. Because mm -hmm. if you want to talk about a gender disparity there, 26 drugs for men for sexual dysfunction, two for women, Viagra was fast-tracked. Six months. Emergency mm -hmm. use authorization. It was a national emergency. Um, <laughs> and I not, mean, I'm not joking. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it really begs the question, right, who sits on the FDA? <laughs> yeah. Who sits on the FDA? Well, it's not a lot of women. They don't, they don't look like us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, only two medications for mm -hmm. women, and yet, I bet you, if I throw out the names, so who knows what Viagra is? <laughs> throw up your hands. Three. Who knows what Vilesi is? Three? Four. You guys, five. That's an FDA-approved medication for low libido. Addie? Okay, a little bit more. Why? <laughs> it's crazy because we're not educating you, but we're also, up until now, have just been grinning and bearing and taking it. and mm -hmm. so. Like you said, we have to be our advocates. We have to partner with our physicians. And so there are treatment options, and both Addie and Vilesi are okay. It's not going to say it in the package insert, but for um, cancer patients, because mm -hmm. they are completely, completely non-hormonal, they are actually written in the ASCO statement. So the American Society of Clinical Oncology 
actually talks about these medications and how they should be offered um, to patients, and they're not. And when I go into rooms of women who talk to me about their low libido and how much they love their partner, girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever it is, and they want to be intimate, and I start talking about these medications, they're like, uh, well, certainly they're probably not covered by insurance. I'm like, yeah, most of them are now. And they're like, well, they're hormonal and I can't be on, no, they're non -horm They're shocked. And then they get angry. It's like they go through all the stages of grief. grief. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're like, well, how long has it been on the market? I'm like, uh, eight years. Um, and they're shocked. They're shocked. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done, but a lot of the work starts with you guys and advocating for yourselves. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to add, I you know, I completely understand that it's very easy for us to sit up here and say, mm -hmm. advocate for yourself. You know, know know what you're supposed to know. Go do your own research. If you are um, going through cancer treatment, that's probably the last thing in the world that you want to do. And you know, just that there there really needs. I I do believe that part of the onus is on this idea of how we create a network of care around us, right? Not every oncologist is going to tell you about sexual wellness. In fact, most of them won't. And frankly, in my opinion, that's not their problem, right? They're there to cure, cure you of cancer, get you into remission, whatever it is. They, that's what they're there for. And I actually don't want their focus uh, you know, pushed away from that. But what I want is for an oncologist to say, hey, a her MD is going to help you, or there's a, con a cancer concierge company called Alula, mm -hmm. right, that help you from remission, uh, excuse me, from diagnosis to remission in every other area besides your actual cancer. And th I really believe we need to start thinking about the spokes. What do the spokes look like in our network of care? What is it going to t take to communicate not having low, you know, or having low libido and talking to your partner about that in a way that doesn't embarrass you, that doesn't hurt their feelings, so that we're not creating problems of in intimacy on top of problems of physiology, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to be talking about this stuff. We, we can't innovate for the darkness. We need to innovate for the light. And that's what I think is so important when, you know, if you leave here, one thing to take away is it's not just your doctor's responsibility. It is about how we are creating these networks mm -hmm. of care so that it isn't one person's job to make sure that you stay well. Mm -hmm. And so you, you talked a lot about sexual health, so I want to dive deeper into, into that um, and hear from, from both of you. But there is, it's, there's so much overlap with menopause and sexual dysfunction. Um, why does that convergence kind of happen? Um, because we talk about you know, vaginal dryness, sexual pain, low libido, and there's all these things happening. But what exactly is happening with our bodies? And if comfortable sharing, like what is going on? So estrogen yeah. and testosterone, yeah. which mm -hmm. support vaginal vulvar, so that's our external genitalia health. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of take a little bit of a cliff dive after. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we're, if we're being well, kind. We're it's, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's like it's plummeting hormones and then like raging hormones. Yes. Like it's this weird thing. Yeah. Right. So plummeting yeah. hormones. And mm -hmm. so estrogen pulls water with it. And so lack of estrogen leads to dryness, like in the face where people will start to notice their joints, mm -hmm. but particularly in their vagina. And then she loves when I give this okay. um, little description. Yep. But the vagina has these really beautiful folds called rugae so that it can expand and um, accommodate your partner or a dilator or a tampon or a toy, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And as we go into menopause, not only does the tissue get paler and thinner, but we start to lose those folds. And so imagine, you know, at first it looks like an accordion. So really easy to pull, stretch, mm -hmm. um, snap back. Afterwards, I mean, I've done laundry sometimes, mom. My mom's in the audience. She's like, <laughs> she never did laundry. But, you know, I've got three kids. So sometimes I did laundry. My son played soccer. He had tube socks. But, you know, it becomes... Yes, I just called you vagina a tube sock, always. which you will forever remember it. Versus no one wants rugae. to be a tube sock. So nobody yeah. wants to be a tube sock, and the only place you don't want to be thin is your vagina. I mean, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. And so, but it's the same thing. Try to pull on a tube sock; it doesn't pull. And so, what happens? Mm -hmm. People experience tearing, burning, pain, and so that is particularly what happens, and why mm -hmm. um, there is sexual dysfunction as far as pain. Mm -hmm. Now, testosterone supports all of our sexuality. Mm -hmm. Do you know that there's a test? We actually have a tool that is validated and used at the FDA. It's called a FSFI. Has anyone ever heard about it? 
Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. About, it takes about two or three minutes to fill out, and it measures all the domains of sexuality. Arousal, libido, moisture, orgasm, pain. Mm -hmm. So we can diagnose if there's an issue, we can figure out where the problem is, and then we can offer you treatment options. And testosterone has been proven to help with all of those domains. Ask me how many FDA-approved testosterone-only treatment options there are in this country currently. Z zero. Yeah. There's one going to be tested this year, so I'm really excited. A testosterone patch is going to go into trials this year. Um, and so we are left with the options of either compounding testosterone, uh, prescribing male testosterone, um, or using other modalities. And there are statements by NAMS. Um, and the global consensus statement, when done appropriately, okay? I have seen women with goatees. Do not go to the little medi spa in the corner where someone's gonna, you know, pop you full of testosterone pellets and they don't know what they're doing. Because mm -hmm. you can do harm with testosterone. But carefully measured, it improves all those domains of sexuality. How many people have been offered testosterone in this room? Or even, has anyone talked? Okay, so that's better. We've got some more. So yeah, so it's not just estrogen. It's testosterone, and for women who go into hormone replacement therapy, and if you have a uterus, you will need progesterone because that protects you against one of the risks of hormone mm -hmm. replacement therapy, um, which is endometrial cancer. And you know, you all have been misled about menopause for a very, very long time. So there was that study, the WHI, right, 2002. Nobody moved on. Not the press, not doctors, not any of us, right? Everyone's like, hormones are bad. Give people the least amount because one arm of the study was stopped. So there was an arm of women on estrogen progesterone, the women that still had uteruses, and then the other one estrogen only. So there was some concern here in the E plus P arm, there was a slight increased risk of breast cancer. And I mean, it was minuscule. Uh, if you are an Icelandic flight attendant, I saw this on a slide at one of the things, you had 4,000 times a higher risk than if you were on hormone replacement therapy. And they hadn't, sh I'm yeah. dead serious. Yeah. <laughs> And they hadn't shown the risk yet mm -hmm. of the improvement or protection of cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. um, in the estrogen only arm, less breast cancer. If you got breast cancer, less chances of dying from breast cancer. And an overall 30% decrease in your risk of mortality. And we took this away mm -hmm. from women. And there have been multiple statements saying we did more harm than good mm -hmm. with what we did. And in that study, we studied too many women in the 70 to 79 age group. I promise you, mm -hmm. we are not chasing down a 79-year-old woman who is happy and going, you need hormones. <laughs> if you study the right population, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that are going into menopause, we talk about that menopause window. So within the first 10 years, you protect bone, you protect brain, and you protect heart. And there is yet a drug to be formulated, made, studied, that is equivocal to hormone replacement therapy, and it is the gold standard. If you are an appropriate candidate, there are patients who can't have it, and I get it, but there are other options still for hot flashes, for libido, for orgasm. Um, and, and there so are other ones coming. And there are other ones coming. Ooh. Big Pharma is, is coming for menopause for sure. Yes. I just, I wanted to yes. talk a little bit about what you were saying about sexual dysfunction, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it's very easy to talk about the, the physical aspects of sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. It's, as I said, a lot harder to communicate necessarily mm -hmm. with your partner without them feeling like you are rejecting them mm -hmm. sometimes, right? And um, Scientific American did a study that between 45 and 55, don't get depressed by this study. Oh God. Uh, it is the highest rate for women of decreased earning potential, <laughs> divorce, and depression. But mm -hmm. I don't think that is by accident. Mm -hmm. I think it is because we are situationally coming, I hear you over there. <laughs> <laughs> situationally, right, we are coming to some big things in our lives, right? Yes. We are in the middle, that is childcare and elder care. That mm -hmm. is, you know, empty nest syndrome and uh, dying parents. And you may look at your partner after raising your children together and be like, do I even like you? <laughs> you know, we haven't really had to talk in 20 years. So now here we are. So, and, and you are at a point where menopause makes it harder for you physically to manage all of these external stressors, mm -hmm. right? So the Mack truck thing is really important. If you know a Mack truck is headed for you, you can step out of the way 
Right. You can take measures so that you are nowhere near that truck when it cr passes by you. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know, then that, that truck is going to hit you the way that it hit me. And yes, you're going to be angry. You're going to be angry at everybody you know who didn't tell you. You're going to be mad at every doctor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is something about even the way we talk about the evolution of intimacy that feels like it's in the dark ages mm -hmm. because we aren't really addressing sexual dysfunction mm -hmm. at this stage of life. Um, and Stacey, you brought up a good point about, you know, I don't know if it's like the sandwich generation or, you know, oh, yeah. what we're calling it where you're, you know, we don't talk a lot about mental health as well as a really core component of when you're going through menopause mm -hmm. because you're taking care of your children or you're becoming an empty nester, right? They're leaving. Your parents are getting older. You want to take care of them. And, you know, maybe you haven't paid as much attention to your relationship, and you also maybe haven't paid nearly enough attention to yourself. Well, that's well. why. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I always say that I I have come to believe that menopause yeah. is Mother Nature's biological fail safe for you to sit up and pay attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, it yes. is really, um, you know, for all the negative things that we can say about it, mm -hmm. the most important thing is that it is a huge opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the reasons you know we haven't talked about it is the internalized patriarchal shame we all have around mm -hmm. this idea that yes. menopause is y your rubber stamped expiration date, mm -hmm. right? What I really believe, having done this now and talked mm -hmm. with you guys so much about it, is that it is the moment that you can really take hold of your health and your well-being mm -hmm. and put it into perspective with what stressors are going to be more difficult for you and how to manage them. This is the time to get your game plan together mm -hmm. because what you do today is what is going to extend your health span, not your lifespan, your health span, so that post-menopause, as Somi was saying, when you are worrying about cardiac, cognitive, and bone health, mm -hmm. those things are going to be so much better off that you will live well into your 80s and feel healthy mm -hmm. instead of having chronic disease for the last 20 years of your life, right? Mm -hmm. We want you to be healthy up until you kick the bucket. <laughs> and part of that is that menopause is the moment that you can really start to ensure that the second half of your life is you have physical freedom, that you have cognitive freedom, that a lot of the things that we have seen in past generations are not going to happen to you. Right? Amyloid plaques are a marker, right? Mm -hmm. When you lose estrogen, amyloid plaques in the brain are a marker, not an indicator, but a marker of dementia and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. There are things that you can do for your brain, hormones included, where you are going to ensure that you have more cognitive skills longer. So this is a very important part in our life. And I would say that, yes, we're angry. We, we grabbed onto menopause because we're like, God damn it, nobody was telling us what, what we should be expecting. Mm -hmm. But now that we're talking about that menopause conversation, which I do believe is going to be the legacy of Gen X, that we sort of broke open that door, it is also time for us to break open the door of what it looks like to be 40 to 70 and mm -hmm. what you are doing with that time in your life. We all think that somehow menopause is the expiration date, right? What I actually believe is that all the values, all the things that you held dear up until now, this idea of youth, of beauty, of thinness, of whatever it is that is all sort of vanity related, but not just that, accumulation of goods, wealth, success, those values have an expiration date. You don't. And you can create a new set of positive values around who you are today that have nothing to do with the ones that you had when you were younger. And that doesn't mean you don't care about the way that you look. It just means that the focus can be on something else, mm -hmm. that you can start to live kind of post-egoically. And I think that is really exciting mm -hmm. and incredible. I mean, it should be, like I always say, like now that I, yes. <laughs> like, you know, 20s were great, 30s were great, yes, of course. Um, but you're entering into the pr what should be the prime, right? And so if you have that education, you know what to expect. Um, I love my children, but like, I'm gonna be happy when they're <laughs> out of the house. So I can do things for myself too. We often forget ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so it should be, we talk about this a lot, it should be also the prime of your life and not, you know, this like, hor people think about menopause, they're like, oh my God, it's horrible. Yeah, it sucks, but there's so much that we can do if yeah. we're prepared. And I, and I feel like, you know, we romanticize being mm -hmm. old, 
you know, that idea that you want to, like, sit with your partner or your kids or something on a bench and you'll be, you know, in old age. But nobody wants to actually age. We just think the idea of being old is cute, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that that is really missing the point, right? Ageism, I think, for the most part, is sexism. And certainly talking about women in the workplace, we were talking about this at our table earlier, four in 10 women in senior leadership roles think about leaving their mm -hmm. job because of menopause. Yep. One in 10 do. And that is information that companies can hold against us when they should be helping us. When, you know, we've gotten through m maternity leave, we have pumping rooms. Well, mm -hmm. you know what? Those pumping rooms could also be 65 degrees, thank you. Right. <laughs> There are ways in which our employers nar need to start getting on board. It's not just the medical profession. You know, yeah. I have patients who worry about, um, you know, the temperature. They don't want to get a hot flash when they're presenting. Mm -hmm. um, they worry about bathrooms, you know, because the collective symptoms that we talk about, about incontinence, um, the tube sock, you know, vaginal dryness, sexual pain, it's called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. There are lots and lots of treatment options. But, mm -hmm. yes, I hear this all the time. I have women who come into the offices and they have towels around their head. Uh, they're in broadcast. They say the lights will, you know, trigger the hot flashes. Mm -hmm. So women are actually thinking about what am I going to do? Can I stay in the workforce? 900,000 women left the workforce in the UK due to untreated menopausal symptoms. And like Kamel and Stacey have shared, they're in the prime of their lives. They have so much to give. Wisdom, experience, I mean, mm. all of this stuff that is invaluable, not, not just to you know, employers, but to the world. Mm. What a time to be taken out. Yeah. Like to me, that is just right. such an injustice. Yeah, you work, you're at the height of your career, and then it's like you're sidelined by your incontinence or like a hot flash, it's terrible. And also we tend yeah. to think about these, all of these symptoms and we're like, oh great, we're just gonna pee in the <laughs> middle of a meeting, you know? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it, it does feel embarrassing yeah. and it does feel uh, shameful and we are afraid of these things. Mm -hmm. But again, management tools are all here to make you so much more confident mm -hmm. about the possibility of any of this happening mm -hmm. to you. And as Somi will tell you, right, not, Menopause is not one size fits all. It's not even one size fits mm -hmm. most. No. You are all going to have your own experience based on so many different things, genetically, environmentally, mm -hmm. and that is why it's so important for you to have your own standard of care with, mm -hmm. your, with your partner who is your doctor. Oh yeah, Kamel's already struck a side deal. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's we um, <laughs> you know, have radio frequency microneedling to treat GSM. We're gonna be publishing our data. Wait, what's GSM? Genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So okay. we have a 90% uh, success rate with incontinence with like a five to 10 minute um, procedure. And so Kamel has already struck a deal with me. She's like, when I'm in the old folks home, I'm like, first of all, no one's putting you in a home. She's like, you're gonna roll that device in. I'm like, girl, yeah. all right. We're, well, we're I'm not, I'm not she's like, depends. you're not gonna, I'm not wearing she's depends. okay with being in the home, but as long as she's not peeing herself. So, yeah. <laughs> like, you and will depends, that thing it's gotten in better, yeah. thinks, or you know, some of yeah. those underwear brands. Yeah. But, you know, and getting back to, uh, the sexual health piece that you yeah. were alluding to, yeah. you know, some of the patients are mad because they're like, my kids are finally gone, I finally have money, and you know, the house is empty, and now I don't want to have sex, or it feels like there's hot yeah. coals, you know, in my vagina. Yeah. And so the World Health Organization said that sexual health is health care, mm -hmm. and it is a basic human right, mm -hmm. and yet we are not asking 50% of the world's population 51. about- 51. 51, mm -hmm. other than how to get pregnant, how to prevent getting pregnant, or what to do if you have an STI or a sexually transmitted infection. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of crazy, and they mm -hmm. think that some of this gender disparity and bias exists because historically most OBGYNs were men, and they looked at mm -hmm. female patients for two outcomes. Um, one, to get them pregnant, um, you know, because they wanted them to have babies, and the second was vessels for male pleasure. That's why, you know, I did 12 years of training to become a doctor that specializes in this much of the body. No one taught me about female pleasure, orgasm, arousal, how to deal with sexual pain. I knew how to help people get pregnant or prevent pregnancy or cure the babies. Um, but it's a real disservice we're doing um, for women mm -hmm. who are gonna spend 50% of their lives in perimenopause and menopause, but 40%. Mm -hmm. Um, and the one other thing I want to clear up too, because I get this question all the time. So we know there's perimenopause and then there's menopause. And people are like, well, when am I postmenopausal? Like, when am I done? 
There are studies that women who are untreated can remain symptomatic for over two decades. So I, I, I don't like the word postmenopausal. We use it for like bleeding and things like that when we're deciding on surgery, but really mm. menopause and postmenopause, I feel like that's worse. It gives you the expiration date. Um, so mm. it's just perimenopause and, and, and menopause, and that's mm. just your new state of being. Mm. But if you think about it, weren't the Golden Girls the same age as oh like God. Michelle yeah. Obama, J Lo? <laughs> J Lo. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Rue man, McClanahan. if I'm going for Blanche or J Lo, I mean, like that. Rue McClanahan. Yeah. But, yes. but see, that's also look at that. Look at the look perception at, of that. Yes, right. That's right? the 1980s yeah. till now. Yeah. We are looking. This is this is also why I think mm -hmm. menopause is sort of a little bit of this kind of tricky, you know, subject. We have age dysmorphia, right? Mm -hmm. We are the first generation, Gen X in particular, to really have benefited from cosmetic dermatology, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and well, not everybody is into it, or you know, I, no judgment here whether you do it or not. People don't look the same way at 50 than they did before veneers, before we knew that sitting was the new smoking, before we knew that g exercising every day was really going to help you, mm -hmm. before there was keratin. I don't know. I'm making up all these other, you know, things that, that, that we use that, that um, affect the way that we look. Right? So this idea that we have to, I read recently that women of a certain age, so, you know, any time uh, kind of uh, during menopause, if they start to use Botox or filler or have some sort of surgi surgical procedure, the goal is to always look 38. Now, first of all, I just think that's stupid. But, <laughs> I mean, even if we're saying that we're, we're going to stay looking 38, right, if that's the goal, if you don't want to be considered old for whatever reason, A, I think that's internalized patriarchal hatred, and, and we need to get rid of that. But B, that doesn't mean that you aren't going to need to treat the things that are going to happen to you as you age. Mm -hmm. No matter how good you look, right, mm -hmm. if you are not taking care of yourself during the menopause experience, it is going to affect the outcome of how you feel for the next 30 years. And that's what makes this so important. Mm -hmm. This is not about, you know, sadly, we're dealing with the vanity and the ageism issue here and the real health issues mm -hmm. that can really make you, you know, live longer and happier and healthier for a, a, a much better outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, just one other thing. Yeah. That, that reminds me that medi spas are uh, an issue for me because I do worry that they're conflating two things, right? The idea that there are healthcare needs and then the needs that you have for looking the way that you want to look. They are separate things. And to conflate them may make women feel like they have to do more than they want to do, right? And that is just something to keep in mind. When you start to see that conflation, you can keep it separate if you want to. That is absolutely your right. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and I wanna touch on, you know, we said that, you know, you forget yourself sometimes during mm -hmm. this period of time. Um, whether you're in menopause or you're a survivor, you know, things are happening with your body and you're changing and you sometimes don't recognize who you are anymore. And Stacey, you had said one time you were approached by a woman who had a double mastectomy and had reconstructive surgery, but she didn't feel as feminine. Mm -hmm. Going back to your story too, something about covering the mirrors. Um, she didn't recognize herself in the mirror and she wanted some sort of help in getting her style back. And I think this also, in not to say, you know, being a survivor is like going through menopause, but you lose yourself and you, you want to get that feeling back of your style and who you are. And so can you talk, a, you talk a little bit about how fashion and even though it seems superficial, yeah. it, what you said seems superficial, it's a way to feel better about ourselves. Well, look, I think, and, yeah. and style for me is a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have style like running coursing through my veins. Like that's never gonna not be a thing for me. But the reason that I was getting really tired of styling people, I'll just be honest. I was like, if you don't know how to define your waist and wear a pointy toe shoe to elongate your leg, you've been hiding under a rock and I have nothing for you. <laughs> um, but it was also that the menopause experience really affected me in a way that I was like, if, if I have any little platform, I need to start using it to raise awareness about this. And I will tell you honestly that somebody from a very, very important company told me that I was committing professional suicide by talking about menopause and not fashion. And I was like, well, you're the problem, so off I go. But what I do think is that style, when you have had any traumatic experience, 
physically or mentally. It is the easiest thing to let go of, but it is the easiest thing to pick back up. It does not require a ton of money. It does not require a ton of time. It requires all that you, all that you really need is to be honest with yourself, right? And what I always say is that if you if you've read my book and if you haven't, truth about style. But it's like <laughs> it, it's ten years old, so I don't even know if it's in print anymore. But the first thing that I say to do is, especially if you have had a traumatic surgery, you have got to stand in front of the mirror naked for as long as it takes until the value judgments that we make about our body burn away. Until we can stop being emotional about what we don't like about our bodies and what we do. I don't care, I, you know, I don't want what you like about your body to make you happy and I, I don't want what you don't like about your body to make you sad. I want you to be neutral so that you can really be objective about, okay, if I like this, that means I should highlight it on my body. And if I don't like this, that doesn't mean I ignore it. It means, I'm gonna sound like Gwyneth here, but uh, believe me, <laughs> I, I don't mean to. Consciously camouflage so that you, you are not hiding, right? Hiding implies shame. Mm -hmm. If you are consciously camouflaging your thighs, your ass, something that you don't like about yourself, then you are still using your body to its advantage, right? Style is not just about geometry. It is about like freedom of expression. You get to control the narrative. And we don't get to control a lot in life, but this is one place where you are sovereign. You get to decide what brings you joy, what makes you feel good about the way that you look. And I don't even give rules anymore because I don't believe in them. I think life is actually too short for all of that. I want you to do the things that make you feel the best, and if you get confused, I'm like guardrails. You know, you choose the car, you choose the model, you choose the route we're going to take. I just want to stop you from careening over a cliff, <laughs> you know? So d I think style has real power because, again, it gives you back something that you've lost. Agency over what you look and feel like. Agency cannot be underestimated, especially after a traumatic event. And, you know, I don't want to put menopause in the same category as survivorship as well. They are different things, right? But when we are confronted with something that makes our body change, mm -hmm. we need to be our own best cheerleader. And sometimes that's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So the idea that style can sort of be a vehicle for that kind of change is never not something that I am going to espouse, right? Mm -hmm. That is, to me, a, a tool in your arsenal. And it can reflect and deflect. So if you are in a great mood and you know it, wear your best outfit and it's going to make you feel even better. And you're going to be funnier. And you're going to be more charming. You'll probably get that account. You'll land that account. You'll, you'll, me you'll meet somebody you, you really like because you will be amplifying your own feeling. But if you are feeling really down, if you are feeling downtrodden, if you are feeling overwhelmed, any of those things, you can use style to deflect what you're feeling so that you don't have to share that with anybody. Everybody else can just see the beautiful person that you are. You don't have to share that sadness. You don't have to share the idea that you're hiding something. It can deflect. And those are pretty powerful tools. Mm -hmm. Your armor is, is, is your style. And you have that available to you whenever you want it. I'm gonna give the medical answer to that <laughs> question. I'm like, really? That's, You're not that's gonna do the style? No, You're gonna do the medical no. <laughs> and I was like dreading. I was like, God, what is she gonna show up in? And am I gonna be able to sit next to her because she's always so fashionable? Um, but you know, there's been studies, and a lot of women um, associate their breast with their femininity, with their sexuality. And so after they've had cancer or even preventative mastectomy they will struggle with their sexuality. It's, it's very, very common. Um, so sometimes, you know, we were talking about mental health, mm -hmm. sexual health counseling, medications will help. Mm -hmm. um, but I also tell them, I said, what is actually our brig biggest sex organ? What does everyone think? Brain, because that's where you feel sensation. Mm -hmm. That's where we have um, neurotransmitters that excite us and tell us yes, buy the dress, go on the trip, eat the cake, have sex. Um, and that's where inhibitors are, like, well, now I can't think about sex right now because I'm, I'm working or I'm tending to my children. Um, what is the only organ 
of either um, gender that is solely dedicated to pleasure. Doing some chaos. Clitoris. How many nerve um, endings in that organ? 8,000. So if we're going to say use it or lose it, which I don't say, yeah. use that. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that is my advice yeah. to you. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I was going to say, uh, before we bring in Q&A, I want to ask one last question. I'm also going to answer this question, too. <laughs> but, um, you know, as I've gone through this journey of working, you know, at a company that's focusing on women's health care, that's focusing on embracing menopause and sexual health and talking about it and being open and erasing this, like, patriarchy, this shame and stigma around aging and anti-aging and everything, um, what advice can you offer anyone? Like, what is that piece of advice at the beginning of this journey or even the end who hasn't really sought treatment or understands? Like, for me, it's actually finding your tribe. I always say that, like, find your people who you can talk to about it because so often we listen to patients and I talk to my friends and now they're ecstatic. They're like, oh my God, you work here. I can tell you everything. But we never talked about it. Even with close friends, I'm closer with my daughter, with my sister, with my friends, with my spouse, um, because I feel so comfortable talking about it and finding those people so you don't feel alone and you don't feel shameful. So that, that's the advice I would give, but I would love to hear from both of you as well before we open it up. I think, you know, Stacy alluded to it. It's mm -hmm. like, if you know the Mack truck is coming, you can kind of step out of the way. And so people are like, when should I start learning about menopause? I'm like, now, because if we're lucky enough, we will all live long enough to get there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are apps out there that help with sexuality. There is the Meet Rosie app that has actually been proven in clinical data to help us with sexual health. If you are like, Dr. Gervais, I'm not ready for testosterone. I'm not ready for hormone replacement therapy. I kind of just want to dip my, my toe in it. Mm -hmm. um, there's topical Viagra that helps women with orgasm. Um, vibrators, a, a study just came out that shows that it helps with pelvic floor health but also helps with a lot of those domains of sexuality. So it's not always medication, but if you know your options, mm -hmm. you know what symptoms may be coming for you, then you can have a much better partnership with your provider because, as you said earlier, menopause and sexual health, it is very, very individual. There is not a, I would love to say, write down love potion number nine, give it to you all. <laughs> um, but it is a very, very individualized paradigm for each um, patient woman. And it begins with her choice and what she wants. I can give you all the data and say this is amazing, but if you think it's awful, then obviously it's not going to work for you. So I would say start educating yourself um, as soon as you can with reliable resources. So funny when you said dip your toe, like if you're not ready to dip your toe into the medicine, I thought she was going to say dip your clit. But no! <laughs> <laughs> we went in another direction. Uh, that's good because I made them cry earlier, so right. now they're laughing. So it's good, um, it's good. You know, really the big thing for me here is that I really want to start a social movement. And part of that is because I believe now that I am almost 54, midlife is awesome. And it's like the best kept secret in the world. And we are not taught to believe that, and we internalize that that is not true, and I think it is time to break that down. And I think we really need to build a positive culture around what we have to offer at this stage of life, because there is no, there's no rule book, there's no guidebook, right? But what I would say is all the shoulds and shouldn'ts that you have internalized or thought about, like what happens to you when you're 50 or 60 or 70, Throw them away, because I really do believe the more we hold on to this menopause conversation, the more that we take hold of it, that is just the beginning. It is just the beginning of a much larger conversation about ageism, sexism, and what it means to have female physiology, what it means for us to age, and how we age in a way that creates healthy longevity. Right? And this idea about longer lifespans, I, I think I read that the person who is going to be 150 has already been mm -hmm. born. You can't start giving up at 40 or 50 <laughs> if you're going to live to be 100. You know what I mean? So let's start thinking about middle age as what it is, the middle. Mm -hmm. The middle is the best part of the plot of the book. 
So, you know, let's get to it and stop tearing ourselves down or even comparing ourselves to either people who are younger or younger versions of ourselves. Change is hard, but I really believe that change can be great if we're willing to lean into it. And I don't think that we have been taught in our culture, in our youth-obsessed culture, to think that there is anything other than that. And frankly, I think that's sociobiological, right? Youth means you're fertile, okay? The procreation means the race good continues. But we all know that's not our sole use value with female physiology anymore. We are contributing to society at every stage of our existence. So I just want you to take that value and own it. That's really what I, I hope for you. Questions? I think we have someone with a mic, if anyone does have any questions. Oh, yes. Selena. Um, let me. There, he's right there. Oh, he's right there. Hello. Hi. I don't, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Hi. So, I don't, it's not necessarily a question. I just remember um, I'm 52, I'm menopausal, right in the depths of it, sweating on this chair. Um, and what I noticed is that I think the biggest question that I have is what can we all do in our lives, with our family, in our communities? Because I know that we'll, we'll have a coworker that's having a baby. Everyone, men and women, want to tell the horror stories of how they gave birth, what it was like. No one talks about menopause. But they'll tell you about being in stirrups and six doctors in a room and they're giving, having a baby. Mm -hmm. But the part of the, my life that I'm going through now, no one wants to talk about it. It's, we were all, always whispered menopause. Mm -hmm. And I think that my platform, I'm on social media, influencer. Um, I talk about that a lot. And so the style portion of it is what so many women say that they're tired, that they gave up, that they don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. and. Just recently, I posted how there's those memes that you see that say men, women, men think we dress for them and we don't. And I said that's not true. We do a little bit, just so you know. Um, but it really is to keep you going, to keep you remembering who you were or who you can be, and that this is actually the best part of my life that I'm experiencing right now. I have a little five dollars. I don't have to drag my children anywhere, and you can still look great, but we're allowed to talk about what we're going through. And I think that if you could give us some advice on how we can spread the awareness to other people and make them understand that if you do have to wear a diaper, that somebody else is, or if you don't wanna have sex with your partner, that somebody else is feeling that way. Mm -hmm. So what can we do as a collective, just lay people to help other people? I mean, use your platform, first yes. of all. Yes. I was gonna I say, am, if, if everybody yes. in this room told two people about their menopause experience or that it is okay to talk about it, you are already exponentially changing the culture around this conversation. And just for me, I would say that this is the extension of the fertility, uh, pregnancy, postpartum, even miscarriage conversation that we are starting to allow ourselves to have. This is on that same continuum. Why would we stop before we're done? So we need this information, and again, you know, this is why her MD is so wonderful. The more that pop up, the more we are going to be able to point people in the right direction. I, we have patients that have started like little wine clubs, so they they tell everyone to go out for wine, but they talk about menopause, they talk about sexuality, they talk about what's going on. Um, book clubs, so they pick books that the main characters are in this stage of life, but then it also gives them a safe space to talk about. Well, if you're talking about the characters first, it feels safer. It gives you that tangible thing to talk about. Um, and then, you know, there are a lot of um, clinics, organizations, brands that will hold educational events. I mean, HerMD, we try in like every market that we're in. But if you get an invitation, you're on a mailing list, invite a girlfriend, you know, or multiple and bring them along so that they can learn. Because sometimes they're not comfortable for either one of those and maybe they're not ready to talk to each other but they're willing to at least go into a room and start listening. Um, and so those are all the ideas that you know I have that you all are very, very powerful. And I always say this, it is our collective voices together that is going to smash the status quo 
because the status quo has never changed anything. And so. the, sorry, one other thing that I thought is that if you are on social media, whether it's Facebook or Instagram, right, there are a lot of um, rules, of course, by the FDA <laughs> around what you can say about menopause or what you can't. Mm -hmm. But what I really recommend is try and follow as many brands or services that you know are specifically around menopause because those are the companies that are gonna start saying, hey, we're having an event. That's how you're gonna hear about them. Mm -hmm. So start following those brands or services or companies that you really feel like are advocating for menopause because then you will know about things way before they happen. Mm -hmm. Hello everybody, my name's Rachel, and I um, didn't think I'd come in here today and then crash at the VIP table and then be the only person to yell out clitoris um, <laughs> at this lunch today. Um, yeah, it's funny because when no one answered, I almost second guessed the answer, like, why isn't anyone answering? Is it clitoris? <laughs> so, um, Thank you so much. Um, you've really inspired me. I'll speak for myself and I'm sure many others around our mindset and heart set towards having this conversation. If anybody wants to have a dinner group book club, I'm the only Rachel Gonzalez Levy on the internet. So find me, go. I'm on LinkedIn. Yes. I will um, be happy to be the one to say clitoris if you bring a group together. All right, so. I love Thank it. You. Anyone else? Really? I'm shocked. I know. Really? Oh, I think back there. Oh, thank you. The two drugs that you talked about, um, I've, I've never heard of them, and mm -hmm. I'm 52 and I'm going through menopause. So do we just go to our OBGYNs and say, I heard about this drug, can I get on it? Or how, wh is there a process of pre-approval? Like, how does that work? Yeah, so um, one is called Addy. It was named the pink pill as a little probe to the, the blue pill. It's oral, you take it every night. And then um, Vilesi is truly like Viagra, it's on demand. So when we get a patient who's like, um, yeah, I'm going away this weekend, I need my uh, libido fix now, I'm like, okay. Um, it's an injectable, you inject yourself at least 45 minutes before you want to want to have um, sex. And so remember that little test I told you about an FSFI? Most of us who prescribe this medication will take that or make you take that test. It's like on an iPad and you just fill it out. And if you have a score, then we can prescribe it for you. And you know, insurance companies are fun when it comes to women's uh, health care, particularly sexual health care. Like, I love the way they'll approve Viagra, but then they won't approve like my patient's vaginal estrogen, so she can't have sex. But m a lot of insurance companies now are covering these medications. There's copay cards, and you have to go to an OBGYN that is prescribing it because I still have OBGYNs. I mean, remember, less than 20% are trained who either don't know about the drug or are not familiar with it or are trying to see patients in 15 minutes or, or their real focus is delivering babies. Um, and you can go to a site called Ishwish. Um, that is I-S-S-W-S-H. Those are um, OBGYNs and other providers who are trained in sexual health and who are very likely to prescribe those medications, right? Because, you know, if you're not wanting to have sex because you have a new baby, that's not normal. I mean, that is normal. You do not want to chase that patient with medication. Or if you recently have gone through an illness and you have you know, sex drive, we're not gonna treat that patient, right? Like, that's normal. Like, if you're ill, you're not gonna wanna have sex. So it has to truly be low libido that's not directly attributable to a life event. Or God forbid, sometimes it's a side effect of medication, like birth control. Sometimes I just have to take a patient off birth control um, and put her on a different form and that fixes the problem and we don't have to chase it with yet another medication. So, a visit, a test, pretty easy. It can be done in one, in one visit.
there are two books that I recommend. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dr. Jen Gunter wrote The Menopause Manifesto. And then there is another book by Heather Corinna, who wrote What Fresh Hell Is This? <laughs> uh, which is the which is uh, funnier for sure, um, but also is the only gender expansive book on menopause, which I think is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And they're both really great guides to just explaining what is happening to you and what you can do about it. And then there's also, like Stacy was saying, a lot of the menopause companies, uh, like ourselves or Electra or Evernow. If you go, there's a lot of educational content on there. Mm -hmm. Um, blogs written by experts, there's chapters, we talk about it on our uh, website as well, so um, there's apps, there's a lot of great resources out there, and then the other great site to go to to find a provider or even find information is NAMS, it stands for North American Menopause Society, mm -hmm. so this is evidence-based treatment options, right, because there's a lot of opportunistic people out there who are trying to make a very quick buck, um, and they're promising you 38, I've heard you're going to walk out with a 19-year-old vagina. I go, I want to learn from this person. Like, who's oh, no. going to give an 80-year-old a 19-year-old vagina? No, 38 yeah. is just face. Oh, just I mean, face. vagina, I don't yeah. know what uh -huh. age everybody's yeah. going for. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, um, but the NAMS is where you can find providers who have chosen to do the training. It's evidence-based, scientifically proven, and they're not just out to make a quick, opportunistic and yeah, you did mention, I mean, I, I know obviously your website has a lot. Electra yes. Health did the 21st Century Guide to Menopause. They did it a couple of years ago, and it was really a, a huge labor of love. But it is very helpful in that they just uh, alphabetize symptoms. So they, they you know, a, a lot of it will, will tend to seem like the solutions for those symptoms all start to sound the same, right? Change your diet, see your doctor, like that, you know, there's only so many options. But at least it really kind of helps validate when people don't connect the issues that they're experiencing together, right? For me, it was that connecting the dots, I, how would insomnia, joint pain, and night sweats have anything to do with each other? Like, how would rage have anything to do with food allergies? Like, I just didn't understand how to connect those dots. And any one issue in menopause, I think, is very easy to dismiss. We're very busy people. Right? If you feel tired, you're like, I feel tired. Like You don't think about it. So I think it's very important to have somebody help you connect the dots. And research like that, like that website or the books that we mentioned, will really help you do that. Well, don't end up like some of my patients. I feel so bad. They walk in, and they're literally a bag of supplements. And they like will just put everything on the table. And I'm just like, they're like well, which one's going to work? I don't feel any better. And I'm like, well. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to find out about a product called Happy Hoo-Ha Cream. She, her hoo-ha yeah. was not happy. So I was like, <laughs> is this is not good for you, yeah. and this is not going to help, and this is not studied by the FDA. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Kamel, yeah. can you guys just go over what is going to be offered at HerMD in June when you guys open? Or sure. Everyone in the yeah. room would love to know. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Um, so when we open this summer, um, well, we specialize in menopause, as you probably have asked our mind from this, this conversation, um, but true menopause care, so evidence-based solutions to treat everything from brain fog, hot flashes, incontinence, sexual pain, dryness, true sexual health care as well. So we're talking about, you know, yes, STIs, contraceptive care, annuals for general gynecologic care, but really... Um, deep expertise in um, HSCD or low libido, arousal disorder, orgasm dysfunction, dyspareunia, um, vaginismus, you know, vulvodynia, just very deep expertise. I'm almost, I'm a doctor by proxy. I mean, I'm listening to her, I'm like, wow. I can do it, I just, don't. just don't let me treat you. Um, <laughs> um, you know, but. Um, You're a great hype girl. Right, I'm a great hype girl, I am, I am all for it. Um, and then surgery. we also do minimally invasive surgery on ultrasound. site, as well as ultrasound and lab. And so oftentimes as women, for, it's like you make the time, we're busy, right? You do one appointment and it's like then you have to go to like five other places. And it's like I just literally had the time to do this one thing and now I have to go to the lab and I have to get an ultrasound and oh, maybe I need this procedure. Everything is done at HerMD under one roof, which is great because we've solved that kind of broken um, healthcare system that we all have to kind of manage and quarterback on our own. 
Um, so we do all of that as well as just annual gynecologic care, endometriosis, fibroids. Um, and then we do have a medical spa as well where we, the other side of the practice addresses anything that you would want to on that side as well. And so it really is like comprehensive care. And we take insurance. Hi, Pearl. And we take <laughs> I mean, I always say it. Someone yeah. said Kamel's the best marketer. If it wasn't, if it weren't <laughs> for her, I would have still been doing my little thing in um, Cincinnati, Ohio, and she's really the reason. Um, she's like, woman, there are people coming from 35 mm -hmm. states and three countries. You are onto something. We need to scale. And I was like, all right, let's go. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Which, let's hope there's more of that in the future. Yeah. Yes. Because all of this, right, what, what's available to you at her MD should not be a thought for the generations behind us. Mm -hmm. They should know exactly where to go and exactly what to do. Yeah, so a lot of what people don't know, a lot of the FDA approved options mm -hmm. are actually bioidentical. So bioidentical just means that it's equivocal under a microscope to what your um, ovaries were producing. So bioidentical doesn't have to be sold to you. You don't have to pay cash for it. So a lot of the, like Premarin and Prempro um, came from pregnant mare urine. They are not bioidentical. But like even this spray, it's bioidentical and covered by your insurance. So yes, we have a lot of bioidentical hormone replacement therapies. Um, I do not recommend oral um, hormone replacement therapy, transdermal options, so patches, um, sprays, gels, actually really reduce the risk of adverse outcome. Um, some studies have shown by up to 70 times less likely. Yeah, there are bioidentical oral ones as well, um, but at HerMD, our preference is really transdermal just based on the data. Um, read the article that Rod Stewart wrote about um, empathy and menopause. I think that's a yes. good starting point. Yes, yep. like, okay, here, Rod Stewart went through it and how yes. it's kind of, I, I wish I would have known because I would have been so much better of a partner. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, there are men that show up to our events because they mm -hmm. want to be supportive, they want to understand. Mm -hmm. And then if there's something really going on um, in the relationship because of you know sexual changes, because of menopause, because of rage. <laughs> a lot of times, well, you know, we talk about the mental health piece, but there should be no shame in um, seeking that out or going to counseling because a lot of times, you know, before COVID, when we allowed the men in the rooms, they'd be like, well, she hates me or she doesn't love me anymore or she's mad at me all the time or there's nothing I can do right. And so really, you know, we get her to feel better, but then we're trying to get him to catch up. And so I would say the same thing, education, um, going to events, starting point that Rod Stewart article I was like this was so yeah. well yeah. written yeah and I, I also think that um, Sue Dominus wrote an article in the New York Times that it just came out a few months ago that really was like an aha moment for a lot of people about the history of menopause mm -hmm. the effects of menopause and it is a really great article um, I highly recommend having your husband read it because empathy is hard when they are not going to go through it in the same way right I mean there's andropause but it's nothing like menopause Right, and, um, and I think that it is really hard in some cases to get people who are not experienced, it. even younger women, you know, they're like, is it really gonna be like that? You know, I'm like, where's the disbelief coming from? <laughs> like, why would I lie to you? <laughs> so it is very important, I think, to, um, to get as much information into your husband's hands as possible because empathy is hard, right? But, but sympathy and kindness and care and support are things that we need to insist on.
can you repeat the question? We oh didn't hear. Oh my God, hear. you're just asking the shyest person in the world. Yes, she's very Mom, shy. Mom, she wants to I know what you feel, how you feel about us doing what we're what doing. We do. More Botox. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. But you know, I, I have to tell you, I love you, Mom, for saying that because we grew up in a Muslim Pakistani culture, okay, which does not, you don't talk about sexuality or sexual health. And so for her to sit here and stand proud, I mean, we broke barriers at home. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, because a lot of people ask that, like, when they hear about our background, they're like, what do your parents think about that? I'm like, they're proud of us. So, yeah. We're very lucky. We're very lucky. All right. Well, I think that wraps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>